So welcome to the second installment of the midterm larger projects for GLPC presentation at Cauldron. We tried to do that um, the first time a year ago. And again, a reminder, this is not about, not about GLPC 3.0. It's not about ditching Time32 support or anything like that. Um, actually, we achieved a lot of things that we talked about in 2017 without changing the so name of GLIPC. So we are still at LIPC SO6. We still have backwards compatibility for now about 25 years or more. Um, this is more about uh, what we can do within the existing framework without throwing away backwards compatibility. So, okay. Siddharth, can you close the door if you're the last person to enter? Not very, but this is a more audience. I think the other talks are slow to finish. Yeah, we were. At the end of the day, everybody's back. <laughs> okay, um, so the, the key areas I see for midterm projects in GDPC are related to maintainability of the library, library itself, because if we can do, if we have an easier job, then we can get more done. Um, then there's programming interface improvements for people writing C programs, writing C++ programs, uh, so that they get a better interface for achieving what they need. Then there's something about uh, performance improvements and observability, uh, so where you can figure out what the application is doing and try to get a better performance out of it. And there's also security and hardening. Um, so for the target audiences, I thought about maintainers for the uh, workflow improvements or internal code improvements, programmers obviously for new interfaces, um, what they've been asking for for a while, and it took us, uh, it's difficult for us to deliver on that. Then sysadmins usually want um, better ways to run exist existing applications and avoid certain pain points related to malloc, gain better observability into what's going on on the system and things like that. Also container integration probably falls under that topic. Um, security prof professionals probably want to look at uh, uh, security hard, additional security hardening so that some certain exploitation techniques that target our Malik implementation or our standard IO streams implementation will not work anymore. And um, address sanitizer integration is probably also interested, interesting for those folks, but it overlaps with what uh, programmers can, uh, can expect or want us to implement. The last time we talked extensively about project hosting and source code maintenance, patch maintenance, workflows and stuff like that. And Joseph made a very interesting comment back then that um, none of the alternatives we have today, which we could switch to, are so compelling that they propel us in that direction. And uh, I think that's still true. There are a lot of alternatives, but none of them is like clearly better than what we are doing today. So it's hard to pick an alternative. And I want to leave it at that for this iteration and talk more about malloc. So malloc in glibc is a bit peculiar. It's based on Dark Lee's DL malloc allocator and the Key innovation in the DL malloc and allocator, as far as I know, I don't know if there's any precedent to that, but what it does is that the, the allocator maintains a double linked list of heap allocations, but with a, with a twist. So the back pointer in that double linked list is only available for free chunks that are not allocated to the application. And this means you can usually, you can always traverse the heap in a forward direction, but in a backward direction, you can only 
look as far back as the next allocated spot because the link is already taken, um, the link point is already taken by the application. Um, the funny thing about this is how this is, express, uh, is uh, expressed in the source code with struct malloc chunk. So the struct always has this back pointer at this first member, but depending on the heap state at that pointer, it may not actually be there. It might be used by application memory. So the data structure is kind of skewed or incorrectly laid out. It's, like, it's how you wrote code in the 90s, I suppose. And there are a couple of other examples in the, uh, in the malloc source code where we just use the wrong data type and do not allocate all feeds in a struct or something like that. And it sort of works. We don't even build it with F no strict aliasing. <laughs> Uh, but uh, I think a first step to, to, towards further malloc improvements would be to clean this up and maybe use different, a different abstraction for that, not like a C struct to store things that are not really struct. Uh, Sorry, I, I, will re I will repeat your question. So, uh, do you mean to say we get rid of the overlapping malloc chunk struct? Like, it, it has this overlapping size t uh, between members. Yeah. And you're saying basically just uh, rip that out and rewrite the whole thing. Yeah, and we, we, I think mostly we already use accesses for managing that because it's not really usable directly. Um, and I just wanted to, uh, I just want us to switch over to using accesses ex exclusively and maybe use different uh, in, uh, pointer types to incomplete structs if we have to represent different pointers. Um. I want to challenge you on this thing, which is mostly like, what is the, what's the benefit for us? Is it that today, oh, sorry. Is it that today when, you, when you're trying to like work through the logic in the code, it is super annoying to have to hold in your head that the struct is actually offset by a member, and then you have to remember that it actually starts earlier. Is the intent of the cleanup then to just make it easier to reason about the code, easier to review it, it puts it into the, it makes it more maintainable? Yeah, and uh, hopefully uh, static analysis tools can give us some hand in the future as well if we... Yeah, because all the static analysis tools are, are wrong because that struct is offset from the actual layout and memory and doesn't match the layout and memory, except it's been shifted by a field forever into the array, into yeah, the fields, it, right? I mean, it even gets worse. So one of the potential improvements is that uh, currently... Uh, um, we have an in-heap header before each allocation that's always present, and it's currently eight bytes, but typically we only use like 20 bits of it or so, or something like that. And we could shrink it to four bytes easily enough. I mean, easily. It's still work to implement it. The, yeah, that's why it's... But the bottom is unused because the size is always a multiple of 16 on on 64-bit uh, architectures at least. So we have, uh, with 20 bits, we can address like, um, and taking the pointers into account, we are at how much memory? Uh, probably 32 megabytes, and after that it goes into MMAP territory, territory anyway, and then it's a different code path. Yeah. So we only need four bytes, but we still have eight bytes, and in the struct it would be a, uh, it, would, it would look even worse in the struct. Um, Does anything stop you from making this change right now? Um, you can say time. Yeah, you can say it's, like, it's time. <laughs> like it's... someone in the audience, go ahead and implement it. Uh, I can repeat your question or comment. Um, I mean, I have no idea it does this, but it sounds like a huge barrier of anybody new to the code. Yes, you know, yeah, it, it is. Which is why... 
Yeah. Uh, it's why DJ Delori. So the question from Jonathan was, why is there? Go, Florian, go. Um, so I want to comment, uh, repeat jo uh, Jonathan's comment for the recording. So uh, Jonathan said that it's a huge barrier for anyone working on the code, this peculiar struct layout. Yes, yeah. absolutely. And DJ Delori spent a significant time writing the malloc internals documentation page to show what it looks like in a visual like graphic of like, here's this weird thing that's offset by a field. So there's that, and there's also like a huge comment in Postman, which does a pretty good job of this. So it's, it's complicated, but it's not it's not mysterious. Yeah. It's not mysterious. I, so I have two, two questions for you that I would like us to keep in mind is that like, as a, myself as a project steward is like, what blocks you from making this change today that we can unblock you to make the change? If it's just people, then, you know, the, it's a room full of people and we can ask for help. And the second piece would be, what's the benefit we're looking for, which I think everyone agrees, maintainability, people working on malloc. Malloc is really a useful API for user space allocation. So having people familiar with it is always good. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think that, yeah, risk. Yeah, what stops you from making the change? What's the risk? And then what's the objective? Yeah, I, I think it doesn't really provide any direct benefit for users today. So it is always a bit, it is a bit of a moonshot to work on. It. Yeah. Yep. Um, but maybe we can, I mean, I. The question more is, uh, can we work on this, or should we should we do further malloc improvements, piling on onto the existing code structure, without cleaning it up first, yeah. and and then let's look at the uh, concrete improvements yeah. next, and then we see why I think we need to to do this. So um, we currently have an ad hoc data structure for managing the different size classes. We have a, uh, we have a different a separate free lists for separate size classes up to a different size, certain size. So that part is fairly fast. But for the uh, allocations larger than, larger than that, we have a certain uh, kind of tree-like data structure, but it's mostly list-oriented. And it might be interesting to to do the same thing that uh, Doug Lee did in later iterations of his malloc and use a some sort of binary tree or try or something like that for representing the larger size classes so that we get a more predictable performance regardless of uh, what kind of size information uh, or what kind of differently sized chunks are there. And if the uh, tree is fast enough, we can also try to reuse chunks in a certain direction so that it's more likely that memory becomes available at the top of the heap or at the end of a page where we can return it um, to the kernel. So uh, the concern I have with the packed heap spot is kind of indirect. No, I, I'm not, not yet that yet. Oh, okay. Not, oh, okay. Uh, I, As, uh, I can talk about uh, packed heap uh, support first. So packed heap support is about um, uh, avoid, so I, I mentioned earlier that every allocation that goes out to the application has this 8-byte eight eight -byte header in front of it. We can reduce it to 4-byte, but that's still like breaking alignment if, or still is still bad because you might have like 16 bytes, 16 bytes, 16 bytes next to each other because the, allocation, the application makes three allocations of 16 bytes. But uh, with our current malloc, it's actually... 16, 16 bytes, 8 bytes unused application memory, 8 bytes header, and then same thing for the other two allocations. So instead of 48 bytes, use 96 bytes. Packed heap support is about redirecting that kind of allocations to a different heap where the size information is implicit by the allocation location and not by a header in front of each memory allocation. And this is what uh, most of the other mallocs are doing. Um, it has advantages, it has disadvantages. The advantage is for smaller allocations, it's more tightly, uh, more tightly packed. The disadvantage is it, it's really hard to implement the 
thread cache that we have. Because a thread cache needs to know is this a small allocation or not, and then it has to do a hash table lookup probably, and that hash table lookup can't use atomics because otherwise we lose the benefit, the performance benefit of the thread cache. And this is a bit of a yeah, research project, I would say. It's still not large. I don't know what they are called, but yeah. But the problem is you need to figure out, is this allocation coming from a slab? Or is it like an MAP allocation? Or is it something from our regular size tech, uh, sized uh, chunk stuff? So uh, slab, I think slab is, comes more into play when you already know that you are in that allocation mode. But our three is totally generic and needs to do a deal with all three pointers. So packed heap, um, regular allocations like we have today, and the MAP stuff. So Carlos was asking, uh, commenting on how to identify yeah. the type of memory based uh, the, on the free pointer. The biggest problem is pointer arrives at free, and you need to know where that pointer came from. And that's just always the case. And in the case of um, the thread local caches, you always want to be able to check the thread local cache. And you, are, you must not take any atomics. Any atomics at that point would require a cache line ownership acquisition. Uh, and for S&P, that can be expensive. So you are always looking, is that memory has to be local for me, for the thread, for the best performance? And if it's not in the thread local cache, then you can go somewhere else. But I mean, uh, for packed heap support, the option is that the thread local cache behaves as if it owns the memory and it's not free. And that has other consequences because it creates um, fragmentation issues and, yeah. No, uh, the issue is that for choosing the right thread cache bin, we need to know the size. That means we need to do the size lookup. And it currently is cheap because we just look at the header that it's always there. But if that header is conditional on some address condition, then we have to do extra work and it's going to be different performance characteristic. And there's no way around that. I mean, there's not. Yeah. You have to do, I mean, if you implement packed heaps as um, we do today, it's a, would you do it with just a pointer mask operation? And then that pointer mask operation always must produce a base structure? No, the pointer mask operation is really bad for cache. Uh, associativity and stuff like that. For sure, <laughs> because you then have to go, you have to pointer chase the start yeah, of the struct is, no, for the heap. It, I looked at it, I thought a bit about it. It has to be some sort of a global array for uh, super pages or something like that. But yeah, it is It is not a small project. It is. A, I think the actual implementation won't be so uh, very involved, but um, figuring out the right data structure that fits um, multiple applications and gives a good good uh, blended how would you say blended uh, uh, performance then that is going to be tough tough thing for us to implement because we just have this one or uh, we have a malloc enterprise and we have a free enterprise and that is pretty much the entire api service and it just doesn't give us much to work with in terms of yeah we're going to give this application that and that the other application something else that is, um, yeah. If you can inf you can run inference fast enough, then you can probably do some machine learning on return addresses or something like that. But <laughs> who knows? Yeah, um, I don't think that's going to be feasible for a while. So uh, the you had a cons I, yeah, you had a cons concern. I had with heap support, uh, packed heap, su heap support, is that uh, so there's there's uh, there's validation in malloc, uh, which relies on chunk header sanity uh, to kind of detect corruption, we basically lose all of that, don't we? If we, if we get rid of chunk headers. Yeah, you just corrupt the data. <laughs> you, yeah, so, I mean, 
Yeah, uh, the question is 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 I mean, valid. There's, there's a question of whether those uh, checks are effective enough to keep them in. Yeah, That's that question aside. Uh, so the the exploitation. So, so what it removes from the picture is a certain generic exploitation techniques that use glibc heap data structures. Um, but even that is probably not going to be that significant because we already have, we still have, I, I want, I don't want us to switch to a totally size class based allocator where all, I think the, the glibc approach of having variably sized allocations right next to each other with that um, header in front of them is, is still beneficial for certain workloads and we never hear about people who don't have problems with our malloc. We only hear about people who switch to JE malloc, TC malloc because it improves their workload. So just throwing out the glibc malloc because some people find out that it doesn't work for the workload may not be in the interest of the overall community because the majority seems, for the majority it seems to work okay. And yeah, there is. Yeah, I think that was a, a, a misbuilt version of TC malloc that's no longer maintained and on top of it. So, so I think uh, uh, with and we had uh, actually parity with TC malloc back in the day. It's just that only your block was developed. Could be, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I have a question for uh, Jonathan, who's in the crowd for C++. The worst case of uh, heap misuse I've seen from C++, where it was like a malloced four-byte class. Is that common or uncommon? And it was like this, it was this huge customer application, and they had like 13 billion four byte classes, objects that they like, because they use a framework and then the framework under them creates things and then they drive the, the C++ framework and then the C++ framework just generates billions of these objects that are all like small classes. Is that common or uncommon? I don't think it's very common. Okay. So for the record, Jonathan's saying it's uncommon, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've, you've told me this horror story many times, I think, or I've certainly heard of this application before. Um, yeah, I don't know what you can usefully do with a single four byte object that's not in a container or something um, very sensibly. You know, it's not big enough to contain a pointer to something else and be part of a linked list or something like that. Um, generally, I would expect applications to create some kind of container of these things. Um, you know, put them in a vector or put them in a, a map or something, but then they're always going to be in a node that has to have at least some other way, you know, something that can hook it to something else. What are they doing with all these, you know, these tiny objects that they're creating and throwing away? So how small is the smallest size object you think you should really be running into? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess a pointer plus a small thing, which with alignment will be two pointers. Yeah, could bytes. be. I know, but it's 16 bytes. We might have to argue it has to be a line. So. Yeah, I mean, if you're having performance. Yeah. yeah, if you're having performance problems using those objects, then don't. Yeah. <laughs> you well, know, you could. The next point, which is like, why didn't you just use a slab allocator, a custom slab allocator, put yeah. in a slab allocator? Or the C17 memory resources, which are. Designed for this kind of you know, slab like. Yeah. Yeah. But something, yeah, something's going to point at them, but you might actually have, yeah, you might be putting all the pointers to them in some container. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I can't speak on behalf of all C programmers. <laughs> um, but I, I wouldn't be too concerned about that case of foolishly creating billions of tiny objects. It just seems like a bad design. Um, the question is, uh, would size delete help with um, 
uh, would help with uh, figuring out uh, where to land the free. Um, I think it could um, it could avoid the global data structure lookup. That might be problematic from a cash footprint perspective. We should still want to make sure that the site's information is actually correct, unless we have special compiler support for that, where the compiler general, uh, basically guarantees that, yeah. And in the C++ case, we may actually have that, where the compiler guarantees that the size information is correct. In many cases, yes. Yeah. And yeah, that, that could help. It creates a bit of a pickle with malloc interposition. Um, but uh, we can work around that. So uh, in glibc malloc, it's supported that you can replace the malloc with something else. But if the applications start to call a function that's not in the currently existing interface, then it will get to the glibc defined function. And at that point, um, we have to be aware of that and probably do something else if the glibc malloc is not active because it was interposed. So if someone preloads JE malloc or TC malloc and it doesn't implement that interface, then um, running an application that calls into glibc malloc suddenly will definitely not work unless we have special counter measures. Um, Since C23 adds a size 3, does that mean that any, any interposing malloc is going to have to provide that now if they want to? Um, I'm pr so Jonathan asked if uh, the C++ 20 C23. C23, I don't know that there's, okay, maybe it does, <laughs> could be. Free size, I mean, it's in the draft, I'm looking at maybe it's going to be next after C23, but yeah, they are free size, like free aligned size. I'm surprised by that because I'm not sure if there's plenty of, uh, like system level yeah. implementation experience with that, but. Um, no, I think that would mean that any. Yeah, we discussed, uh, I know. Yeah, I now remember, uh, remember we, how we would implement that. I, I think I discussed it uh, with the person who was proposing or, or championing it in the C23 context. And the way to implement that in glibc is that we define this function in glibc. But um, uh, we use the size information if glibc malloc has been initialized. Uh, but if it hasn't been initialized, we just call free in the, the expectation that that free has been interposed with something that works with the malloc that is evidently being used by the application because we haven't seen any malloc uh, calls so far. And that's just one additional check that we have to do anyway because someone can call free a uh, sized, uh, sized free on a null pointer and at that point, our data structures won't be there. Well, yeah, so anyway. But then the, the integration analog doesn't need to happen because you have a fallback. Yeah, we have a fallback, and uh, they just get the uh, non size free instead. So it is a tiny bit of extra overhead, maybe, but not that bad. And if I can figure out how ELF dynamic linking works, we can maybe use an indirect function to get rid of that. So yeah, it's really hard to figure out if you have interposition or uh, just a PLT stop in the main program. Time yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so the other thing is, uh, yeah, we can track MAP allocation separately because we can see that the most, uh, the lower 12 bits or lower 16 bits are zero. So that's an easy way to offload that and it would uh, free another flag bit we can't use in the header, which helps with shrink shrinking that header. The other... Yeah, but the, the, you can just waste that or put it to the f previous allocation. Uh, there, there's plenty of, of, uh, of tricks you can do. Um, it, you have to do extra checking, but it's on this low path, so we don't really care. Um, there's the, and there's also tracking MMAP allocation separately also helps with observab observability because today we don't keep track of them at all. They have their special header, 
And when, once we see the special header, we do an M unmap instead of a regular heap free. And as, because of that, the M unmap we can always do, that's the kernel job. We don't have to keep off that memory block anywhere else and we don't. We have a size counter somewhere, but that's it. So keeping track of this, these applications may, uh, these allocations may help with observability of uh, application heaps as well. And we keep the track of how many we've done and how many bytes we've done. Yeah, but, uh, but that's not anything useful. Nah, you have to, you would have to scan all allocations and then try to do some magic and... No, no. Um, Okay, there's ASIC virtual CPU ID that's um, uh, trying. So we have a problem that we create too many arenas on certain systems up for certain workloads. So we have many threads and then we have a lot of wasted memory and the hope is that we can use the ASIC virtual CPU ID that's MMCID in, in that struct to use exactly as many arenas we need to get um, full uh, concurrency so that we don't have any contention on the arena log. So that no, um, so Sidesh asks if uh, this is a question for mainly tweaking arena max, and I don't think I agree because uh, in order to reduce the arena count without increasing contention, we have to switch from per thread arenas to per CPU arenas, and that requires um, changing the way we select the arena. And so it's no longer assigned to the thread, basically for the thread's lifetime, it would have to be on each um, malloc call. We would have to pick the current CPU arena some way and then The, 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 the RSEC stuff is totally magic. It doesn't require any pinning. It is just does. Does it implicitly pin? No, it's just no. No, no, no. It is. So because right now, uh, the default arena max is h times the number of CPUs. And the, the, the working logic behind that was that uh, address space in 64 bit application is virtually h times. Yeah, it is. It is. It doesn't make sense. And it's a very quick hack to reduce that eight times the CPU to say four times the CPU or two times the CPU. So, and see if that picture is correct. Uh, Sidesh asks whether it makes sense to reduce the arena, uh, arena sizing, uh, not sizing, uh, the maximum arena count to a different uh, factor based on CPU number and what we see in a container context with uh, large applications is that um, setting the count to something really low that even matches the CPU allocation for the container like the container may have like four f uh, fractional CPUs allocated and we set it to four um, it doesn't really work that well because the arenas are so sticky and then if you're unlucky and you have like four concurrently running threads that all use the same arena then you're in a very bad position because they step on and then on each other okay. yeah they, they say we don't It is, um, and the, the virtual CPU ID, if we can make it work, uh, solves these issues because we do a per CPU allocation, which is not 
probably not that interesting if you have just one application running on your machine, but if you've got containers that do some sort of CPU re restriction and that doesn't really translate to any of the traditional mechanisms like affinity masks, then um, the virtual CPU ID t takes that into account magically. I mean, it is really magic. Um, you only get a number that is uh, as high uh, or one below even uh, the number of uh, current, current, concurrently running threads on your process. And this is exactly what we want for this case because that is the maximum number of um, arenas we will ever need to avoid con con contention. Uh, the default will be meaningless if we implement the virtual CPU IDs because uh, it always gets. Yeah. Yeah, but the, you would use it, that, that's certainly a way to, to do it, like uh, write the new malloc as something that can be preloaded, for instance. So you wouldn't use system preload. Uh, we would system preload through at EDC, LDSO preload or so is, is the file, and we could use that. And then. So it doesn't run preload. I mean, uh, yeah, but. Yeah, then it, you want to use iFunks and yeah. Not, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah, there's definitely ways to, to work on this without uh, starting with the GLIPS integration at first. Um, so this is something that I think should have priority in the malloc context because um, what we've been asked repeatedly internally by customers, uh, by partners, is to get better understanding where things are with the malloc heap layout that GLFC malloc produces. And this is, I think this is probably necessary for um, making forward progress on some of the issues we see with uh, RSS utilization. We tried to cover this by doing a tracing malloc that worked, that it created so much data that it wasn't really usable for us as an analysis tool. Even for smaller, small sized heaps, uh, if you need to look at a problem that only materializes after millions or billions of allocations, you have this extremely large trace files. And then it's not even guaranteed that if you replay the trace file, you get the same heap, la heap layout because yeah, these uh, traces are somewhat lossy. Um, yeah, the idea is to have two modes for this uh, heap statistics from core dumps. So you can just uh, use gcore, the command to generate a core dump, or uh, the, have the kernel generate a core dump for you, and then move the core dump to a different box and convert it to a heap dump there, or do live heap dump from uh, from a live process. And the idea is to, to do the generic form work, um, have some basic analysis tools for counting certain interesting statistics for our implementation, and then have maybe third party, third party sounds uh, a bit fancy here, but people can write a Python script or whatever to maybe R or whatever they want to use to figure out something interesting about the heap dump without having to work out how the intern internal data structures in GFC malloc actually work. Dallas, you've got a question. Yeah, would you, so I, I think it's fantastic that you mentioned focusing on the artifacts because I think that the full tracer 
what happens is it produces so much data, and then you have to ask, then you basically have to write custom analysis tooling after that. And that's what I've had to do like several times. And then I keep adding the custom analysis tooling, but it's like, what's the histogram of the data? What's a scatter plot of the data? What's a log log plot of the like size of the allocations? And you're always looking for an analysis that is often an application centric analysis where like the developer has to know how they use the allocations to write the analysis tool after they then look at it. Um, would your focus here be to provide a heap dumper and then provide an interface to the dumper for the developers to like kind of look at the data themselves? Uh, I would expect that, that the output format is, is SQLite. Okay, okay, perfect. And then the developer can then just write their own tools and like, yeah. like look so at the data. Based on the schema documentation, they can just then... Fantastic. So the second follow-on question I have to that is time. And how does, I mean, one of the, one of the interesting consequences of the allocator is it doesn't know what time it is, right? And yet time is this really integral part of when was the last time you did an allocation here? How long has this allocation been in the uh, logical heap preventing me from freeing back uh, a heap? Where, who did it come from? Ownership as well. Like, do you have any thoughts on where time and or ownership would come into this? Um, so the question I see is more like, uh, is more basic. So yeah, maybe we have allocations that are sort of blocking further heap consolidation and making money, uh, memory available for different use. Uh, but I think what we see in the artifacts is a bit different. I think that there's large, there will be large stretches of memory that could be freed, but currently aren't or not returned to the kernel at least. And we can improve that if we know where to look. That is that is my personal expectation. I could be wrong about that. And if there are allocation patterns that in that in those heaps, and we see that across many applications, then yes, we might look at the time difference uh, or the time and the timing aspects or, or age of allocations and thing, things like that to figure out if there's something we can do about that. But I think our problems today with uh, memory tension as far as the kernel is concerned in what top and in reports in the RSS column, that's way more basic than that. It's like we only have return memory in one direction from the top and even though there could be different spaces where could be uh, different places where we could do uh, the allocation and I think the first step would be to look at what can we do realistically <laughs> with the yeah the 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 introspection support would probably live on the side yes. so that we can use it with different versions of malloc from yes back uh, until glipc 2.28 or so, something like that, because that's where so many users are. Um, that, 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 that's sort of independent of the glipc model code, and we wouldn't reuse the struct definitions or anything like that anyway. We would just do it with integer arithmetic or point arithmetic in, in that heap bumming code. Um, yeah, that's it for malloc from me. Uh, we have still more, a bit more time, so we can get it's a little bit further in the slides. Um, completely different topic, still about memory allocation to some extent. Um, so because we support DL open in glibc, uh, you can load new code with this, you can load, uh, load new variables with DL open, and you can load new thread local variables with DL open. That means we need to have a mechanism so that the memory that is associated with each thread can actually um, support newly loaded variables. And there's some one, one way of doing thread local variables is called initial TLS, initial exec TLS. Um, 
and I think the initial XX stands, stands for it's there when the process launches, um, right from the start. And that's basically uh, all you need to describe a TLS variable is its offset from the thread pointer. But we reserve a certain amount of memory for that. Currently, the, the, the thread pointer points to somewhere on the thread stack for non-main threads um, because the, the thread control block is still allocated at the top of the thread from the thread stack, basically. That's a leftover from Linux threads, which you also use the trick to mask the thread pointer, uh, the stack pointer with, they, they only had a fixed size two megabyte stacks or something like that, and they just masked the stack pointer to get uh, to the, the TCP for the current thread. Um, and we still have that architecture, even though we don't do it this way anymore. Um, what, we, what I thought one year ago is that, yeah, let's use address space because we are on 64-bit for the most part and just uh, um, allocate a lot of access spa uh, address space for this. And uh, once we deal open something, uh, we start carving out um, and allocate packaging storage for more th things that were used in the address space. And the initial address space would be like 64 megabyte. And if you create a second thread, then you get uh, the main thread still has 32 megabytes left. And the new stack has also potentially 32 megabytes and so on and so, on and so forth. Um, and then in the end, uh, you can, it's fairly likely because deal open happens during process startup for the most, for most applications that you can still satisfy deal open requests um, from the, uh, the Slack space you still have. But um, yeah, maybe that's over engineering it and it still, there's still the gap that you can't serve a certain deal open requests. Um, the other approach would be to make you new know, to TLS much faster and fix the uh, reliability issues with GNU2 TLS. GNU2 TLS currently uh, uses an array of module per module thread addresses on every thread and the complicated management to make sure that the array is up to date. And each, uh, each uh, module in the sense so each deal opened object, each module has a pointer on that array and when you use TLS for the first time from this module, then it gets allocated. But of course, for thread variable access, we don't have a way to report allocation failure. So the only way we can deal with memory allocation at this point, a memory allocation, sorry, memory allocation failure at this point is to crash the process, which is not great for reliability. So um, we probably need to clean this up. And at that point, uh, we can do, we can make the descriptors much faster, like two loads, two indirect uh, memory loads or something like that, that depend on each other. But in the case of the descriptors, the descriptors fall back to uh, global dynamic, right? If they go IE eagerly, then they're probably going to be good. Yeah, the, the idea would be to make the uh, global dynamic pass, path in the code almost as fast as the initial exec pass. Um, you pre-allocate everything um, at deal open time or at process start time or thread creation time. And so everything, all, all TLS that you ever need is there. And then uh, you lay out the uh, module uh, offsets. And then in, in the descriptor, um, uh, you have basically uh, the first the first, you have an array of pointers for TLS variables on every thread. And the first pointer has maybe 4K, one page, or 64K, uh, 4K of uh, data bagging it, the next at 8K, and then maybe we jump to two megabytes because that might be interesting for alignment purposes. And the, mod, uh, the, the module ID or whatever used as, as an index has uh, the lower six bits or something like that 
give you an array entry and the rest is the offset in the array. And then you just load your slice of the array and relative to that is your uh, TLS memory and then it's uh, a lot of the problems we have today go away. And it is almost as fast as initial exec TLS. And we can even make that array part of the ABI and put it into the TCP at a fixed address if we are satisfied with the performance characteristics. Uh, and that seems to be a better way to deal with this than the address space approach, I, I think. And So, uh, Siddharth's question is how this affects cache locality. Um, one, one thing we do today, the, the location of the TCP at the bottom of the stack has the nice benefit that we probably save a TLB entry because the stack has a TLB, a TLB entry for it and we just reuse that. At least on some architectures, uh, the TCP is small enough that it's on the same page. So it's probably not the case on x 664 but we should fix that. There's a lot of uh, historic baggage there that we don't need anymore. Anyway, um, so that is, and we move, want to get, go away from that. Yes, it will cause increased TLB pressure, but compared to the current um, yeah, we, we, we wouldn't use this for initial exec TLS. Initial exec TLS wouldn't go away. So initial exec... Initial exec is going to stay in TCP. Well, no, but it's actually stays altogether. So that... Yeah. Initial exec will have to be a question for all the initial exec. But, uh, sorry, initial exec has to stay close to the third pointer because the API says this is the offset from the third pointer. So that, 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 that won't change. What we can do for the descriptor-based TLS access is that, and we do that today on most architectures, I believe, um, is we have, a, we have two functions for accessing global dynamic TLS. One is used if it's actually initial, in the initial exec TLS part. So this is a really fast one. And only the second one does this complicated dance with a global uh, version counter and uh, the module array and DTV or lookups and whatever. And um, the second part would go away, the first part would stay. Um, yeah. But in, but again, it's slightly down if you've got, if you've got huge numbers of TLS variables. But which point you don't really care about caching and counting because it'll be, it'll be blowing all the caching. <laughs> Yeah, and the, the 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 global address array for the new thing would be much smaller because uh, currently each slab for each uh, module is separately allocated using malloc, and we don't know where this is placed at all. It could be, uh, yeah, and then it, and we don't know where, how this is placed. So, um, what will happen with the new allocator is that because we put everything on that single slab or single slice of memory, as long as we have space in it, it it's going to be co-located with our TLS memory, which probably today isn't the case. So I, I expect it's going to be beneficial. Shabaj has a bug report that I linked from the mailing list posting, and that's also in the speaker notes, um, that uh, discusses this some more and some tricks we can do uh, to do this within the, largely within the current implementation framework. And we are almost out of time, I think. Yeah. What blocked us from doing this last time, specifically because you can fix uh, uh, thread int a equals value in a signal handler with a new allocator that's uh, AS safe, is that when you do this, you lose the visibility to the debug tooling for the allocation, because the allocation no longer comes from malloc. And so then its visibility to subsequent developer tooling disappears. Or would, we, could, would we still have to continue to consider how we solve that problem here? So if you look at the discussion, I think it was around 2.19 for GLIPC. 
if you look at the discussion, the patch that implemented the async single self allocator, which is not what we're doing here, it's, it goes in the same direction, but um, I think this is, good. This, is, this is intended to go further. But what happened there was it, the, the patch was merged quickly before the release. Someone noticed that address sanitizer wouldn't work anymore. And then uh, the release, I think Roland made the right call and said, okay, we can't investigate this in time for the release. Let's revert it for now and come back to a later point. And we never did that. Um, regarding address sanitizer integration for this, um, nothing prevents us from using malloc for allocating the TLS backing storage in the new model. We wouldn't do that by default, I think, but we could if we detect that address sanitizer is loaded at process startup, we can uh, just switch to do malloc for these things and then, then they have visibility. Yeah, but uh, the overall effort is just like really small additional effort. So I, we just need to be aware of, yeah, it's a good point. We should uh, check that the address sanitizer tooling still works. Um, there might be some issues because they look at the TCP internals and that's really not something we can change. Um, that's just wrong to do, but yeah, I think if we use malloc, then the leak detection stuff that was broken before will just work because they still see the allocations as application allocations. And it's not something we would do for the production allocator for the reasons that we want, yeah, we want to have more control over where, play, where we place the malloc, uh, the memory, but um, I think we have a way to deal with this. So I think we can give room to the lightning talks now. Yeah, last two minutes. Yeah. Last question. Now let's open the window and yeah. <laughs> thank you.